Should I stay or should I go? 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 Should I am like society say so? Should I stay in hell children? time slot myself being of course your host Madison Foster and yeah got lots of great stuff coming up today lots of great new music gonna get to lots of great Canadian and local music as well like hey have you heard the new record by so young try me it's pretty sweet if you haven't yet I'm gonna get to the first track off of that this is 16 keep listening Wolf is radio will be here until 11 on CHW 94.9 FM are you thinking about me? Are you talking about me to your mom and your dad and to all your friends in class? Are you thinking about me? The number of times I've been asked if I write the songs is staggering. You know, like, oh, do you write the songs? It's like, if you are a woman and you're on stage, and there's even one other, one man on stage with you, like, you could have an all-girl band, if there's one dude on stage, someone in the audience is going to assume that they are the ones that are leading the band. Like, no, I'm very clearly the leader of my band, and, like, the number of times I've seen a sound person or promoter go to a, my band member to talk about when we're going on stage, or what we need for our sound setup, or whatever, or payment, even, and it's like, no, I'm the band leader. I'm very clearly the band leader. You assume that the other guys in my band are the band leaders, or the one they're the ones writing the songs, or they're the ones booking the shows. And like, no, no, it's me. Like right over here, one with the boobs. It's over here, over here. <laughs> it's still ingrained in us that like women are pretty and nice and feminine, and they don't yell and they don't they aren't vulgar or they aren't any whatever these things are and. And so I think when you go up on stage playing rock music, you know, you get, if, if a guy, if, if an audience can't put you in like, oh, are you the skanky, sexy bitch or something? Or are you like prude or are you like a, fe like a feminist butch lady? It's like if they can't like place you into one of these boxes then you're going to have a lot of backlash. Someone asked me to bring come to their show, and there was like six bands playing or something. I was like, "Oh, are any of the bands have women in them?" And the guy was like, oh, "No." I'm like, "Oh, that that's too bad." You know, it, I kind of just like poking a little bit, like, "Oh, six bands with five dudes in them each. Cool. That sounds really fun." Anyway, and he was like, "No, there aren't." And I'm like, "Oh, that's too bad." He's like, "I don't really like. I don't. I mean, like, I don't really like female voices. I mean, you're good." And I was like. Okay, first of all, so you're already saying you do like female voices, you like mine, and like I'm the one girl you like. But then he's like, oh, and I like Hole, and I like, uh, I don't know, and he said like the Distillers or something. I'm like, so you do like women voices, you just don't like women. Like you just hate women? I don't know, it's so weird. Someone's like, I don't like female voices. Like, really? Yeah, you do. And also, maybe you just don't like anything, maybe you're just an idiot. new album which is for sale and it's uh 
What's about being like depressed and then realizing that maybe you're depressed because like dudes suck? <laughs> and being a girl in a band is kind of hard. Yeah! All the symptoms are pointed in one direction. All of the sleep in it, do you think it might be to be fresh? Or scene is always going to be influenced by the city that it is in and London is really conservative um, London is you know London is not very supportive of artists it's not very supportive of immigrants really um, lower class like poor people um, and so when you when your city when the people who are marginalized in your city aren't really supported then it's really hard to have a thriving art and music scene and it's especially hard to have one that is diverse because you're only going to have the people in the scene are the, going to be the people who can afford it so you're going to have mostly richer people like people from middle class families people going to western white people mostly people you know who are educated and, and can get jobs or whatever and so that trickles down. If you believe in me and what you are to me and what you mean to me could be what we are. sake and then just like somehow now we got her pregnant and made me I mean, but he could have he probably did that in fucking every little town in Canada you know what I mean you know imagine like there's a lot of people at those clubs back then it was like really people adored musicians because they were the DJ they were the person that were curating the entire night you played for four hours and you played five nights a week right? yeah it's weird how things work you know? one kid well, you got lucky because it could have been way a lot fucking worse <laughs> Imagine that, eh? I always remind that. You got lucky, Ricky. Yeah. His name's Rick Steves. Yeah. I always talk about him. I adore that motherfucker. Yeah. But he got sick, too. He had a stroke. And that kind of stopped him from playing. And then he made a comeback and stuff. Because music is a really good way to kind of fix the brain. So he had a stroke on the left side of his brain, which is like motor skills. Right? And so the right side of his body was just like, Wah. right? So it was picking hand and stuff, and face and jaw and stuff. Like, but it wasn't so mental. It wasn't like parts of his, like maybe parts of his character, or whatever. But it wasn't like, I guess he got lucky for the stroke, right? Um, but with music and stuff, and that's when I started playing keyboards. Actually, that's kind of funny. When he had a stroke, he bought a little keyboard, 
to help him kind of work his motor functions back, right? He never played it, I started playing it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he had this body, and uh, then got a neck, and uh, this is made from bone. It's like the bone, uh, I can't remember what we call those things, but EMG pickups, you know, he's got this one buddy, and just set the whole thing up, and the play's beautiful, and it's gonna add itself, and it's gonna be another little thing that he does. You know, I mean, not now, now what's gonna happen? So Ricky builds this guitar for me, and now, next thing you know, this guitar is gonna have a half-life. And someday, you know, it's gonna be on a bunch of, you know, songs and a bunch of stuff, who knows, records or singles or releases, whatever, but this thing's gonna have a half-life, and then ideally, one day, I'll have to pass that thing on, you know? If somebody, you know, maybe my kid. You know, it's be cool. <laughs> Um, so Aaron's playing the shows and he's doing his one one uh, one man sets, um, and they're great, fantastic. And he plays a song called Five AM, right? When he's playing at APK, and I, and I can hear the melodies in my head. I can be like, I know where this fucking song can go. So I bug Aaron, let me produce this for you. Let me produce this for you. I broke up with my girlfriend at that time, and I'm living in a one bedroom apartment on Richmond, just like in the slums, just like super broke and super not depressed, but you know, I didn't have cell phone, I didn't have internet. It was really fucky. You know, I think I was taking out loans with cash money at the time, and like just like the worst, right? 20% interest, you know, bi-weekly. You know I mean? Just that poverty cycle was real. Produce 5 a.m. and I feel like we fucking hit a home run. You know, I love that fucking tune. And it wasn't like it blew up and everybody was like, but some people were like, this is a beautiful song. It really meant something to a lot of people. And then uh, those people got together and they were like, Greg, we want to get you a, um, everybody wants to like invest and we'll get a studio space for you. And you can be like the engineer that will all chip in money and like this kind of idea. And then, uh, I was looking around, we've seen this place. I was like, guys, fuck, let's just move in here. see it. I work with a lot of out-of-town bands and 
this summer was working with Mars Mouse, and um, <laughs> those guys were playing the musical, and they were shocked. They they actually said on stage, I don't know if anybody was at that show, uh, Isaac Brock said, it looks like an atomic fucking bomb went off at the center of your city. Where am I? It looks like zombies and like just crazy people walking around. That's literally what he said. <laughs> that's what he saw when he came to London, Ontario, right? He saw Richmond and Dundas and that's what he experienced. And that was like the theme of the day. And I can't explain to you how many times I hear this from bands that I work with, like, that come into town, like, whoa, what happened here? Like, this is crazy. I feel like a lot of people just come here and they just trash, they just trash it, they trash the city. And then they're like, I'm out. Going back to wherever I came from, the GTA usually. And uh, it's sad. It's been a long time since we've had People want to sort of dig their heels in and stay, um, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. I'd love to see that happen um, because there's some of us that are getting pretty tired. I'm getting tired. <laughs> I'm just trying to find a space. Gardens and then go to Cowboys on Friday night to Jacks on a Saturday night. Yeah, there's certainly, so, there's certainly a big, a big audience. For yeah, so if you know you're not a, a dad in a cowboy hat, you know a suburban cowboy, or if and if you're not, I, I don't even know. You know if you don't enjoy going to White Oaks Mall for the ten thousandth time in your young life, or wishing you know West Mount was still a thing, uh, it gets kind of boring. You know, like I could, you know. We're a really big city, but there's nothing to do. It's super, super alienating. Super alienating as a town. Like all these malls, it just seems so out of sync with what, what people want and expect from their environment. You know, all these big, empty industrial spaces. It's it's really too bad that there's this like excellent scene, like like across the board, like. Electronica and hardcore and like folk even like that's not really my thing But I will acknowledge there's a great folk scene in London like You know, where do you go? If you if you go back in the history of like what a bar was what a pub is it's a it's a space for the public It's a public house, so it should be used for what the public is doing and currently what the public is doing is putting on a lot of shows and you know, what all they want to do is, is profit off a bunch of old bar flies or like, you know, weekend warriors, and that's super shitty. Well, I think maybe the underlying motivation is you're always going to reach someone outside of your friend group, right? 
you know, someone is going to, like, be so struck by your poster on the street that they're going to check out your show and discover some great local band which they would never have discovered otherwise. And I think maybe in a more political way, DIY means going outside of the normal means of power in order to do things for yourself, not having to, you know, go through the rigmarole or having to appease the right people in order to make what you want to make happen, just doing it yourself and relying on your own network of like-minded people to, to make those things happen. Yeah, I go to the library because they, uh, they're used to just weird shit, you know, downtown. So if you're using the photocopier, they don't look at you funny. But if you go to a variety store, they think you're stealing. And I'm just, I'm just trying to make a shitty show poster. And they don't understand that. I and... think in any, any place where there's an overarching conservatism, you're going to find a big pushback, most often amongst youth and I think that kind of goes hand in hand like rebelling against conservatism and young people it's like that's that's a punk <laughs> um, so I mean I would think that would be a very like surface answer I also think you know there's a huge unemployment right here and there's a lot of restlessness and there's a lot of like really talented people who are like living paycheck to paycheck so there's a lot of frustration and there's a lot of resentment and I think this is a really healthy outlet to let some of the, that negativity out or like make something great out of feeling shitty all the time and kind of feeling like you have no future. Shit, but I know a, a house is better than a venue in my opinion there's no stage no sound guy there's no bouncer you know who IDs you every time you go through the door just to 
cause shit with you and then, then sell coke to you if you're, if you're looking, you know. There's none of that crap. You know, there's no quasi-promoter. There's no quasi, you know, agent there. Um, there's uh, no need for that stuff, in my opinion. You know, if you if you are serious about what you do, you will play in, in the gutter. If It doesn't matter, you know. Um, I've played everywhere from, like, a museum and, like, an art gallery and, you know, the London Music Hall, but I'd rather play, you know, some basement as long as it's not full of shit. here is this big hole that I put in unintentionally with my butt during a uh, bike cop set uh, but I know we were just playing and then I went like this or fell into it in some way and I didn't even notice until after we were done and someone's like you know like yo dude there's a massive hole in your wall and I'm like fuck so whenever I move out of here I'm gonna have to take a day to fix that and all these other whole I think there's one behind that as well but I just haven't bothered to look at it uh, these are all from guitars these like little like headstock shaped holes some of them are fists you can tell like that one I believe there's another fist one over there somewhere it's supposed to be a fire alarm that's supposed to be right here but it uh, I kept going off, like I kept beeping because it was in like some sort of like test mode and I, we just had no way of fixing it, like I tried everything uh, short of smashing it so I just took it out and uh, now it's uh, unspoken of fire hazard. As you can tell by the, the futon downstairs uh, and the lack of amps, it's you know, it's kind of chilled out a bit here there's a few you know there's a few cats that live here now it's like it's, it's very different i think than what people were used to seeing you know oh there's just my bass amps and and uh, some speakers and the drum set that's it as opposed to before when there was like you know like six by twelve two six by twelves and like you know three cabinets and like a bunch of amp heads and pedals everywhere and microphones you know it, it is kind of weird, but yeah, it is kind of good to move on, I guess. A lot of scuff marks on the walls, too. You can tell it's actually the walls are just from all the sweat and people being down here. They're so dirty that it's like you go to wash them and they're just like a mark left by like where you washed. I mean, I might as well, I guess, come, come clean with it. It's basically like I stopped doing shows because I found that I was kind of contributing to something that I wanted to get rid of when I when I first started doing these and, and mainly that was uh, the first order of business is to get rid of a lot of these kind of barriers between people that uh, you know normally like their bands don't play with each other they don't interact with each other or whatever they're you know whether it's a different genre whether it's um, you know just a, a clicky thing or whatever it sucks when uh, when people come up to you and tell you that, that, like, you know, like, hey man, I'd love to come to, you know, more of your shows, but I kind of feel excluded when I go. Because, um, like I said, that was something that I wanted to get rid of. Like, I wanted people to not be excluded, and I wanted, like, clicks to not exist and whatever. And for a time, it was, it was pretty good. But, uh, but, you know, now I've kind of just come to realize, you know what, like, I think these things are inevitable if you f if you, it becomes too much of a of a mission as opposed to just something that happens. Yeah, not really a whole, whole bunch left down here. Just whatever's left of my stuff and some of my band's material and 
garbage bags. Gotta take out the trash sometimes soon. What do uh, the Sidrup starting on time with John and John doing the dishes have a comment? It never happens. Oh, fuck you. I always do the dishes. Yes. It's awesome. John, one time Thanks, fam. John, one time told me it was so hard to find Oh, it's fucking right. Um, I can't remember, I can't really remember when I started lashing out at people and, you know, hurting them, but I was really young. I was probably in like the third or fourth grade. I wasn't getting along with my peers and I was taking that out on them and then I would take it out on myself as well. So I did some, some anger management and some, some therapy at that age. And they try to like accumulate my feelings and tell me that you know it wasn't it wasn't the people around me that were were hurting me. It was myself that was doing that, and that's absolutely true. I don't know why I was so angry, but I but I was. And my my parents never really talked to me. They weren't great talkers. They didn't talk things out, but they they gave me music. They gave me those early punk records to show that maybe. Maybe I'm not so alone, or, you know, people are angry as well about shit. So that maybe I could accumulate those feelings into something that was positive instead of negative. And I got my, my first guitar when I was 12 years old, and I played that motherfucker every day for hours. Just creating that outlet for myself. It was the most important day of my life, probably, was finding that I could turn my, my anger and my aggressions, my, the things I enjoyed and things I hated into something positive. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know what would have happened. I don't know if I would have got into into drugs or crime or or whatever, but I I definitely needed an outlet. I I probably would have found music eventually, but I think it would have been a long hard road to get there. Uh I don't know. I don't I don't really remember what I was capable of doing, but I was awful. And yeah, if I didn't have music, I, I really don't know what I would have gotten into. And I've always kind of dug the more emotional side of, of punk rock, like, like your Minor Threats and your Black Flag. And um, like melodic hardcore and stuff like that, because they were more like, okay, I'm internalizing these things because you fuckers keep feeding me that. Why don't I take what you're giving me, say that I am not this person, and turn it into something we can all use together? Because that is super relatable to have you know someone say yeah like I get pushed around a lot too the people in my life can suck and uh it's a beautiful thing to be able to relate to somebody who doesn't fucking live anywhere near you you can get that expression out that way yeah. Well, because of this this beautiful city and the people I've met throughout the years doing it, I've I found solace in myself too. I know what I'm capable of doing and what I'm capable of expressing. I want to get certain things across, and I want to grow as a person as well. So 
I'm I'm happy. This city's meant a lot to me. Even even through its bullshit, even through its like good times. It has been I a very important city to me. And I don't think it's fair to to knock it because you haven't found a proper place in it. And I don't know how other people are being treated, but I want everybody to be happy and be able to to do their own thing. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Do it for yourself, not for them. <laughs> history a little bit more because um, my grandfather was from here and you know was forced into residential school through adoption because he was born out of wedlock and um, his father couldn't take care of them and as soon as he adopted out um, my grandfather and his si siblings they, he, he drank himself to death in, in, a, in a local dive bar he was a laborer, and uh, you know his death certificate just says Indian, and so it's it's really hard to tra retrace your steps. But I'm really fortunate that my last name is Sturgeon because it's a native name, it's a Ojibwe name, it's a Chippewa name, and it's from this territory. So it's really easy for me to uh, sort of figure out, oh, who am I related to? It turns out there's a Sturgeon on this street, you know, and we're we're relatives along the way, you know, first or second cousins or something like that. 
And it becomes really interesting when you get into uh, talking about race and, and things along that line, um, because I, you know, passing white and uh, I don't know, since coming to London, I've realized the one thing that, that I do have is a voice. And uh, so I put, I put a lot of that intergenerational history into my music and, and talk about it and um, as much as I can when I'm comfortable to do it. And I can't always do that at shows and stuff like that. You know, We just played the biggest shows of our lives. And uh, I didn't really talk about it that much, but hopefully in the music, people kind of get the clue that we're talking about colonialism, we're talking about marginalization and, and racism. Music is just an amazing way to be honest with yourself and to find the truth. You know, our live show is quite ferocious and it, it's just this incredible release that, that, uh, that we seem to need. And uh, that release, even just sweating, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible uh, healing process. <laughs> I don't know, I just never thought to like try and have someone else do something for me. <laughs> you know, it's like DIY culture is do it yourself. And it was just like, oh, I want to make a record. So I have to do that. So I had to record myself. I had to do the packaging, you know, and I guess maybe the bands and the music I was listening to with my friends were, were informing that, that mentality. But uh, yeah, I, I just started it and uh, over the years it's just gotten better and better and in a lot of ways it's, it's just stayed the exact same. Um, I mean more now than ever, Out of Sound is, uh, is back, to, back to its roots. Yeah, it's so natural and organic to me. I, it is hard to talk about Out of Sound. It's, uh, you know, I, I just like adore the, the, the bands and the people that, that I work with. And they probably don't know that. <laughs> you know, my, my darkest times have definitely um, been in London. When I was a kid and things were happening to me, I didn't understand them to the full extent. But as you get older, you realize that some of the things you thought about, uh, you know, things like, you know, being sexually abused or something like that aren't, um, they aren't what you made them in your mind. And you begin to question them. You question who, who you are and, and the, the people that have informed your life and, and you question the support that you've had and all those things. And, uh, you know, for me, it was like a couple specific people that helped me turn my life around. Um, my partner, my bandmates, um, and this, and this guy by the name of Arnold Lascelles, who was, uh, you know, a counselor on the reserve, and he helped me. He helped me the most through it. 
um, he taught me how to deal with it. And the craziest thing, no, nah, I don't. I don't think I want to talk about the craziest thing about the, my relationship with Arnold. It was just very juxtaposed. Everything that happened to me were things that he did, and because he came, he came into my life and was so honest about those things that I felt like I could trust him. And it's like, if I can't face what's happened in my life head on, like he did, then I won't get better from them. And I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, <laughs> I'm an artist. <laughs> but, uh, you know, those, those, time, those, those darkest times, I think, are past. I'm sure that there will be new challenges. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that deep-seated um, pain is gone.